I'm going to draw a picture, and I want to see if you can guess what I'm drawing. You can go ahead and blurt it out. That's close. Ah. I might have heard it. Yes, sir. I think it's a truck. It looks like a truck. It is a truck. That's a cool looking truck. Hmm. It's all right. We'll get back to that in a second. The significance of the truck. Ten years ago, someone would say, hi, how are you doing? Our typical response would be, I'm fine, how are you? I'm fine, I'm fine. Ten years ago, we were fine. Now someone says, how are you doing? What do we say? I'm busy. I'm busy. I love to mess with people's minds. Sometimes they'll say, Ed, I bet you're really busy. I'll go, no, I'm not. I haven't done one thing for the last two days, and I'm loving it. <laughs> Why are we so busy? Why do we say we're so busy, 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 busy? We bow to busyness. We can OD on opportunities because so many things are at our fingertips these days. We can surf squillions of websites and channels and choose from a, from a plethora of restaurants and activities. And, 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 and we talk about busyness and people being overstimulated and overchallenged and overdone and over the top. And is it a new thing or has it been around for a long, long time? Is it kind of a a thing we're just experiencing in 2005, or is it something that's been going on for a long, long time? This series is called Retro, Getting Back to the Basics. We've stopped and, and taken a, a look in the past, and hopefully because of that, we can make decisions in the present that will give us a phenomenal trajectory into the future. It's great to, to go retro. But the question that hangs in the balance today is this, is busyness something new? In Luke chapter 10, Jesus Christ had a courtside seat to a cat fight. Two sisters were going at it, Mary and Martha. And let's talk about it for a second because the place, Bethany, two miles from J-Town, Jerusalem. The time, six months before the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here's what happens. Begin Luke chapter 10, verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. That's pretty, pretty plain, pretty benign verse. Martha opened her home to Jesus and the disciples. I want to ch chase a quick tangent for a second. Hospitality is what Martha did. We talk about the characteristics of being a Christ follower a lot here at Fellowship Church because after all, this is a Christian church. And one of the character qualities we forget to talk about is this quality called hospitality. The Bible commands hospitality. We are hospitable in our hearts as we invite Christ to come into our lives. Then Jesus tells us that we're to be hospitable. We're to open our homes, our condos, our dorm rooms, our houseboats, whatever, and invite others in. That's how the whole early church emerged. Read about the early church in Acts chapter 2. They met in temple courts and in big areas. Some had 40,000 people come into one area. And then during the week, they met from house to house. The whole thing, the infrastructure was all about hospitality. So as a Christ follower, we're to be hospitable. Are you being hospitable? That's not where I'm talking about today, but I just thought I would chase that rabbit for a second. Let's go back to this, this, this a court side seat that Jesus had to a cat fight. Look at verse 39, the plot clots, okay? Martha had a sister 
named Mary. This is not the mother of Jesus Mary. This is the sister of Martha Mary. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening. This word listening in the Greek is the word akuo. Say it with me. Akuo. We get the word acoustic from it. Akuo. It means, it means literally comprehending through listening. She sat at the Lord's feet. Don't miss that. Listening, comprehending what she was hearing to, to what he said. Look at verse 40. Martha, though, was distracted. Read here, drawn away. It's in the imperfect tense, which means she kept on being distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, she's starting to whine here, Lord, you, 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 you can feel it. Lord, check out her tenor. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Wah, 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 wah. In other words, she was saying, Jesus, you don't care. Frustration leads to victimization. And it always ushers in exaggeration, every single time. Lord, you don't care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. As I read that, I wanted Jesus to say, you tell her. But he didn't. <laughs> Verse 41, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you're worried you're all messed up and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is, say it with me, better, and it will not be taken away from her. What was going on? Martha was in a mess. Martha was into this mentality called Martha mania. Talking about retro, Martha was a maniac, maniac, she was a maniac. She was worried about the process, not the person of Jesus. She was worried about the superfluous, not the significant relationship she could have established and deepened right there. So Martha is into all the process, all the stuff, all the superfluous. Yet Mary, her sister, is where? At the feet of Jesus. Sounds to me like they were battling busyness back then. Sounds to me like you could OD on opportunities back then. Sounds to me like we've always had that struggle. So what are we going to do? Are we going to be involved in Martha mania? She's a maniac. Or will we become very merry? That's cool, very merry. How do we become very merry? We sit at the feet of Jesus. Why do we sit at the feet of Jesus? Why do we do that? Why do we listen to him? Why do we get involved in a kuo? Why do we comprehend through listening? Why, why, why? Because of time. Jesus is the author of time. He's given us time. He's the only one who knows how much time we have left. He's the only one who knows when we'll clock out. So, if that is true, which it is, We've got to spend time with the author of time who can show us how to use time because we have just enough time to do the will of God. Just enough time to carry out his principles and his priorities through our commitments. Priorities. Rank and order. First things first. Priorities are simply God's principles. God's principles are my priorities, and they're carried out through my commitments. Say it with me. God's, wait a minute, that's you and me. God's principles are my priorities, and they're carried out through my commitments. How does that take place? We can't do it in a vacuum. We can't do it alone. It has to be the God thing. We have, to have, we have to have inertia. We have to have a force that causes the inertia to bridge the gap between our priorities and our commitments. Because if we get very, very serious about looking at our priorities, most everyone will sign off. We will check off on our priorities. 
God, oh, God's important. He's number one at relationships, my friendships, marriage, children. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm all up in that, man. Now I'm, I'm, I'm feeling you. Church, oh, yes, yes, I'm here at church. Work. Priorities have already been set. All we have to do is go retro and read about them. Principles are priorities. We either agree with them or not. If we begin to list our commitments, if we begin to journal how we spend our time, if we begin to go online, fellowshipchurch.com, and begin to really record how we spend our moments, we're going to be shocked and rocked because in most people's lives, in most people's lives, there is a giant ravine, a gap, a delta between priorities and commitments. There's a there's a ravine that most of us think is small because we say, oh man, my, my decisions reflect my priorities. I mean, we're in sync, we're connected, we're together, it's tethered, man. Yeah, we're, we're, we're tight. But as we begin to journal, as we begin to, to hammer some stuff out on the keyboards of our computers and laptops, we go, wow, there is something different. Last time I told you about a camping trip my son and I took. Took my Ford F-250 4x4 pickup, strategically packed it. We put first things first. We threw out the stuff that we didn't need on the overnight camping trip, like a basketball, like several computer games, like 14 pair of tennis shoes, stuff like that. I said, EJ, those things, we don't need those things. We're just staying one night. We're out in the middle of nowhere, 25 miles outside of Fairfield, Texas. We were driving along saw what we thought was a small ravine. I said, son, you're going to see what four-wheel driving is all about. I crossed the ravine. The small ravine became a monster chasm. The truck got stuck. I misjudged the distance. I misjudged the gap, the variance. We crawled out of the truck. We couldn't get out. We hiked in triple-degree Texas heat to a dirt road. God had an elderly woman driving a car down the dirt road. I flagged her down, told her I was a pastor. That probably did not help, but she invited me into the car with my son. We drove to town, went to multiple record services, and one guy, one guy, he was like an angel, said, yeah, I'll pull you out. We drove back in his nuclear-powered wrecker, and his wrecker, had that force that caused the inertia to pull the truck out of the mud and the mire. We misjudged the distance. Last time I told you, priority determines capacity. We've got to put first things first. But also, capacity determines priorities as well. Here's what we do. We say, okay, my priorities, I'll check off on them. Intellectually, I'll agree with them. God, relationships, church, work. Then we come over here in this column and we do life. And we add and add and add. We think it's insignificant. We, we think these little decisions don't matter. But remember, in the world of priorities, the insignificant is significant. The mundane matters. And let's say this is like a three-quarter ton truck, but we put four tons worth of stuff in the bed of this truck. What happens? It begins to sink. It's too much weight on our vehicle. We're exceeding the capacity. We're broken down. There's a giant chasm, a ravine between our commitments and priorities, and we miss, we miss the best in this life. We miss the best. This is a big rubber band. We're going retro. I could, you know, do the headband thing. Now headbands are back in style, aren't they? Have you seen that? Now the basketball players kind of wear them like this, you know. What's up? <laughs> Let's say this hand represents commitments, my decisions, my choices. This hand represents priorities, God, relationships, my family, the church, and work. And, and I'm telling you, man, they're together. Oh, really? They sync up. Oh, really? If you're not spending time 
at the feet of Jesus. If you're not being very merry, if you're into Martha maniac, this rubber band will get stretched. And you can stretch it and stretch it and stretch it and the gap will widen. You talking about stress? You talking about anxiety? One of the top causes of stress and anxiety happens to be a result of indecisiveness. We don't know which way to turn. We don't know which choice to make. And we get tighter and tighter and tighter and more anxiety and more stress because of indecision. And if I keep pulling it, especially as strong as I am, I could pop this rubber band. Pop my hand, maybe knock an eye out. I don't want to do that. What happens? As I begin to sit at the feet of Jesus, as I begin to spend time with the author of time, what happens? The rubber band begins to relax. It begins to get soft and things happen. I have margin. I have <gasps> breathing room and I can sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to him. Question, who is the only one who knows how much time I've got left? Jesus. Who is the only one who knows what's best for me? Jesus. How in the world can I understand what this life is all about? How in the world can I balance life's demands? How in the world can I bridge the gap? How in the world can I create the inertia to bridge the gap if I'm not spending time with the author of time, if I'm not sitting at the feet of Jesus? Are you a Martha maniac or are you very merry? Let me give you a couple of suggestions. And I need these suggestions now. I need them right now. We need to come to a point where we taste the grace of silence. That was like 10 seconds. Wow. Woo. I thought something had happened, Ed. I thought you were choked up or something. I was just being silent. Silence. We've forgotten how to be quiet. We always have to have the radio going, iPod, surfing, squillions of websites, channels, surfing, talking. Fidgeting around, we've forgotten how to taste the grace of silence. We've forgotten how to sit at the feet of Jesus. We've forgotten how to akuo and listen with great comprehension. I'm going to challenge you to spend time listening to God. God wants to meet with you. He wants to meet with me every single day. He wants to say, how are you doing? He doesn't want us to say, oh, I'm busy. Oh, I'm just, I'm busy. I'm, I'm, I'm busy later, God. Maybe, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, and, and maybe at church in a couple of days. He wants us to have enough time. He wants us to have enough margin to say, Lord, I'm fine. He wants us to talk to him, to walk with him, to listen to him. Well, Ed, what are you, what are you talking about? I mean, how can I get my brain around what you're talking about? Several suggestions about tasting the grace of silence. First, establish a time where you taste the grace of silence. And the best time, I believe, is in the morning, a.m. It's like tithing. Whenever I talk about tithing, the word tithe means 10, I'm never talking about giving. Tithing is not giving. We bring the tithe. Everything we have is God's. All our money is God's. We just bring it. We either bring it or we don't. We either agree with God or not. The same is true with time. Time is a gift from God. 
we spend time with the author of time, he will show us how to multiply our time and utilize our time and leverage our time for greatness. We spend time with him in the morning, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes listening to him, journaling, talking to him in prayer, being still. Phenomenal things will happen. My wife gets up early every morning before the circus starts in the young household. She'll get up between 5 and 5.30. And so often when I get up around that time too, Lisa, where are you? She'll be in her office or at the kitchen table at the feet of Jesus, reading his word, journaling. People ask me all the time, Lisa, how are you so balanced? How do you have the ability to say no? How do you get so much accomplished, Lisa? How do you do it? Is she superwoman? She's at the feet of Jesus regularly. At the feet of Jesus. A consistent time, also a consistent place. Where is your place? Where is that, where is that holy ground? Where, where is that special area in your life that you, that you sit at the feet of Jesus? Where is it? In your study? At the office? In your bedroom? We have to establish a place. Establish a place. And, and turn off all technology. Turn off all interruptions. Draw away. Read about the life of Jesus. You can read these chapters this afternoon. Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 11. You know what Jesus did? Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. You know what Jesus did? He would have these IMAs, intense ministry activities. He's healing people. He's preaching. He's answering questions. He's debating all of the legalistic religious people. And suddenly, the Bible says that Jesus would just walk away. He would take a boat ride, build a fire, eat some food, spend time in solitude, in silence as he, as he talked to the Father, as he listened to him. And I've discovered that is true with my own life as well. As my responsibility increases, as a man of God, as a, as a husband, as a father, as a leader here at Fellowship Church, the more time I've got to spend away in solitude and silence at the feet of Jesus. And here, here's the struggle, the pastoral struggle that I have as far as spending time with Jesus. As I'm journaling, I'll sometimes write, Lord, am I, am I talking to you today? Am I listening to you today? just because I want to crank out another talk, another sermon, or am I talking to you because I really hunger and thirst for you? That's why it's so important to draw away, to have times of silence and solitude, to get away from the racket and the ruckus of life and to sit at the feet of Jesus. We need a strategy also. We need time, we need a place, we need a strategy as well. If you're a brand new believer, take your Bible and turn to Psalm 139. It's right in the middle of the Bible, pretty much. And Psalm 139 talks about who we are before God. It says we're, we're a poem. It says we're a piece of art. It says we're made in God's image. Read that chapter for 14 days. And ask yourself, God, who is saying it? What's the deal? And how can I apply these words to my life? Maybe you've been a believer for a long time. Go to the book of Romans as you read and listen to God. Maybe you're saying, well, man, I don't, I don't really know how to read the Bible, and I would like to know more. We have a class called Cracking the Code. Go on fellowshipchurch.com or look in the worship guide, and you can show up for this class. It teaches you how to read, how to study, how to sit at the feet of Jesus. Taste the grace of of silence. In those moments, in those meaningful moments, God will leverage our time and sync up our priorities. Here's another suggestion. We need to set the pace of simplicity. Set the, set the pace of Simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. Our lives can get so cluttered and, and we can have so many opportunities and so many commitments. When we spend time with the author of time, when we taste the grace of silence, Jesus will give us the force, the positive inertia to do what? 
to declutter, to simplify our lives, to throw out the computer games and basketballs and 14 pair of tennis shoes. We can do that. Ephesians 5, one of our foundational texts for this series, verses 15 and 16. Be very careful. This word careful is an accounting term. Be very careful how you live, not as unwise, but as what? Wise. If we aren't wise, the urgent can steal our time. Look at verse 16. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. The most, the most. God is a God of the most. He wants us to make the most of every opportunity. Some of the type A hyperactive, hyperactive people are going, oh, okay, make the most. Oh, I've got it now. I'll just add more and more stuff. I, that, that's what it means. I'll add more and more stuff. And, yeah, yeah, give me some more coffee. That's not it. Making the most of every opportunity is doing what? It's agreeing with God's priorities, but also it's disagreeing. It's saying no to a lot of commitments, to a lot of choices, to a lot of stuff we have out there. It's going retro and looking at the past and going, man, God, I blew it there. I messed up there. I fumbled the ball there. I got stuck there. I had too much stuff in my, in my truck there. So based on that, I'm going to be wise. I'm going to make a decision today to declutter, to simplify, so I can have a better and more focused future. Got to make the most of every opportunity. As I get older, Lisa and I have to say no more than we say yes. And that's the problem with a lot of you. You're saying yes, 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 no. Yes, 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 no. Yes, 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 no. It should be no, 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 yes. No, 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 yes. No, 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 yes. If I'm the enemy, which I'm not, if I'm the evil one, which I'm not, I'm not going to come to you with a pitchfork and horns, I'm going to mess your time up. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to get you to say yes to the good, because the good will eclipse the best. I'm going to turn you into a yes, 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 no person instead of a no, 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 yes person. Well, okay, I declutter, I set the pace of simplicity. What do you mean? Well, two things. Number one, get some liposuction. Don't misread me. Life o suction. Jesus is called the great physician, right? We have a lot of calendar fat going on. We need to put, this is funny, we need to, you can go ahead and laugh. We need to put our stuff, our junk, on his operating table. We need to say, Jesus, how does my calendar square with my priorities, because your principles are my priorities, I agree with them, how do they square? Number two, we put the calendar on the table, and we say, Jesus, you're the only one who can give me the force, the power, the octane, whatever, to have that kind of inertia to suck the calendar fat from my life. What is lean, what do I have to have, and what is fat? If we're open and honest, the great physician will show us. I'm just gonna gonna pray for you in a couple moments to have the guts to get some liposuction. Now why are we doing that? We're doing that for the best. We're doing that to sync up our priorities and commitments. And here's a, here's a cool way to remember what I'm saying. This is kind of a funny way, kind of a preacher way to remember this. If we look up, that's spending time with God, listening to God, we will line up our priorities and then we'll lighten up our load. That'll preach. We look up, then we line up, then we lighten up. Am I preaching right? That, that's a good way to remember it. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, we, so we get some liposuction. Also, we do something else. We watch for an eclipse. 
couple weeks ago, came home from work. Lisa and the kids were lying in the driveway looking straight up. Honey, she said, look, there's an eclipse. I can't quite see it. Then I was beside her. Yeah, yeah, I see it, I see it, I see it. We got to watch for an eclipse. And get this one down because our opportunity can eclipse availability. God wants our availability. And we're giving him our availability when we spend time with him. Opportunity can't eclipse that. Once again, I'll ask you, what are you saying no to? What are you cutting out? What are you allowing the Lord to suck from your calendar, that fat, that junk that's clogging your arteries that will give you a priority attack? What? Jesus said it in Matthew 6, This is the ultimate verse on priorities. He said, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Most of us read that, and we play a game called reverse the verse. We say, oh, okay. Uh, but seek first uh, all these things, these things, all, all these things, and then, yeah, I'll add you, Jesus, you know, in your, in your, in your kingdom later. But I, I can see the things first. And no, no, no. Seek first his kingdom, look up, line up, lighten up, <laughs> and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. We've got to take that time with the author of time, because the author of time, the God of the universe, is saying to all of us, how are you? How are you? And too many times we say, no, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. When God wants us to spend time with him and say, Lord, I'm fine because my priorities and my commitments are synced up. Let's bow for prayer together. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your pace. It's so easy to move at a NASCAR type pace that we miss tasting the grace of silence, that we missed setting the pace of simplicity. So many times we look back as we go retro and say, what have I accomplished for you, God? Yeah, I did this, I did that. I bought this, I traveled there, but does it really matter? God wants our lives to matter. And he is the one who can lead us, who can show us, who can tell us how to do it. He can get us out of the mud and the mire. He can bridge the gap if we'll just let him. So Father, give us the ability to begin that positive inertia, to close the gap. For Christ's sake we pray. If you look at me for just a second, you might be saying at this time, well, Ed, how about, how about Martha? She's a maniac, maniac. What happened to her? John 12 says that she had another shot at this, at this whole meal thing. She prepared another feast for Jesus and his disciples. And guess what? Apparently she got it down cold. She was not into exaggeration victimization, all that stuff, humiliation, whatever you want to say. She wasn't into that. She understood the deal. So, so apparently, because of, of a, a close encounter with Jesus, she got everything down cold. But the big thing, the big question that we have to ask ourselves is, are we a Martha maniac or are we becoming very merry? I want you to know that God has the best in store for every single life here. He wants us to leverage time for greatness, and we can if we spend time with the author of time. And over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about some other huge areas when it comes to the commitments of priorities. We're going to talk about relationships. We talked about our relationship with God, but how about with other people? Do you ever spend, feel like you spend time with the wrong people? Too much time, you know? Do you ever feel like you don't spend enough time with the right people? We all struggle with that. We're going to talk about leisure. What does it mean to chill? 
I've talked about to have margins and spacing. What, is that, what does that look like? What does that feel like? This will be in this series. So continue to, to pray for us as we unpack this. Also, I'll pray for you as, as you begin to, to um, log all your time on our website or maybe you write it down because I believe God's going to do some serious stuff in all of our lives when we look at our priorities compared to our commitments. And too many of us are too frightened to do it, but don't be frightened. I'm telling you, God wants the best for you. So I will see you back next time. So thanks for being here.